Hi everyone and welcome to this guide for GM Tips and Tricks. I am SWRPG Guides and I am uh, making this because I think it's important to have just kind of a general overview of GMing in the Star Wars system and um, most importantly I want to make sure I kind of divert from anything that might be said in the books or any of the GM kits or guides or things like that. Um, there will be some overlap, but I, I just wanted to give my own interpretation of GMing in, in this system and go over some um, some things that I've learned over the, the amount of time that I've been GMing. You know, I've been running a campaign now for several months and, uh, you know, I've really learned a lot from in input from my players and also just from analyzing sessions to see what's what goes right, what goes wrong, and how I can adjust my style in order to um, make it more enjoyable for the players and also, you know, more enjoyable for myself as well. So um, if you are new to the game or maybe you've played a little bit and, you know, you want to get into GMing, you want to create your own campaign, um, I do have a campaign creation guide. So um, make sure to watch that one if you're, you know, specifically looking for that. But this is just kind of like, you know, how to GM, you know, it's not going to go specifically into making a campaign. So I do have these kind of 12 items that I want to go over in this video. Um, and I apologize, this isn't a flashy video. I don't have lots of videos or things like that. Um, it's just going to be kind of like a podcast setup. And uh, I'm going to try to go through as much as I can. And um, hopefully, you know, you'll you'll find it helpful. So um, there's no real order here. I do kind of have a general flow of of the things that I've listed, but um, yeah, there's there's no real like you know step by step way in order to, to learn how to GM. Um, but anyways, the the first thing I wanted to start out with was outlining your campaign. I think this is something that is really important to do, and uh, you also when you outline a campaign, you want to make sure you find a balance between what you want to plan and what you want to, to leave open. Um, I think some of the best moments that I've had in you know, campaigns and one-offs that I've done come from inputs from the players. Players will give me ideas that I haven't considered, and that might um, inspire my next session or, or where I want the story to go. So I think kind of laying down the the uh, checkpoints, you know, the, 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 the certain things you want to hit in the storyline early on is really good and this also comes into preparation of npcs which is the second thing that we'll go over um, but as far as how i i outline things um i think you know i said this in another video it's important to figure out the starting point and the ending point um, i think locations figuring out you know important locations that you want players to go to and also the style of your campaign what are you trying to um what are you trying to have the players uh, get out of this campaign? Is it, well, first of all, depending on the book, you know, if you want a Force and Destiny type of campaign, if you want um, Age of Rebellion, you know, Rise of Separatists or Edge of the Empire, you know, you have to decide what type of campaign it's going to be and, um, you know, what your style is going to be, I think is important because we all have different things that we are interested, certain things in Star Wars that maybe fascinate us or we think are interesting. So I think putting your interests or the things that you love about Star Wars into your campaign and into your storyline is really helpful. Um, I, for instance, prefer Edge of the Empire. I love the Outer Rim and I love kind of the, the underworld of Star Wars. That is something that I um, really want to explore when I GM, so th that is my preferred setting. Um, but I, you know, I, I still like all the other ones as well. Um, but to physically, you know, lay out the outline, start with the beginning, start with an end, put some, you know, certain checkpoints that you want down, um, or, you know, think about the arc of the story. You know, you might want to start off your story a little slow, maybe have a couple of small, you know, engage, uh, encounters or, you know, fights, and then kind of, you know, as the story comes along, maybe you have more battles, more intense missions, and then maybe at the end there is a really big, you know, boss fight or something to, to kind of wrap everything up. So kind of have that ready before, you know, you can go into anything else. Um, and that brings me into, you know, preparation, how I prepare um, a lot of this topic. I go over in uh, the campaign creation guide a little bit more in depth, but I think it is important to have a wealth of NPCs. I also think it's important to choose locations and not only to choose locations, but choose specific points 
in locations. So for instance, if you're choosing a planet, know what cities are there, know what the, the environment is like, know what type of animals are there, what kind of plants are there, really do your research and, and figure out what parts of a planet you can use um, and how you can really bring your own story to life and, and bring locations to life. So, you know, preparing things as in-depth as you can is is very important. Um, and we'll go into kind of NPCs a little bit you know, later and some of the other things on the list. Um, but really, preparation, you, you cannot uh, you cannot over-prepare for a campaign. And, and really, I think one of the mistakes that people who haven't GM'd make is that they don't prepare enough. And uh, it, it's, it takes a lot of work to not only read the books, the books are very long, um, and to get all the rules, but then to put so much time and effort into actually um, you know, formulating what they their campaign is going to look like and, and the specifics because it is world building and world building you know takes a lot of, of effort. Um, but I think the payoff is great because you want the players to feel like you know if same as like a, in a sandbox game or an open world game, you want them to feel like they can go into a certain part of a building and access maybe a closet that is there, um, or they can talk to that. NPC who's standing by, you know, the corner that maybe they have no idea who they are, but they can actually go talk to that NPC because you know what that NPC is and you have a little bit of a background with them. So you're, again, it's world building, you're creating um, a narrative in order for the players to feel engaged um, in the storyline. So um, going into kind of descriptions of uh of environments this the, the, the really again the world building is the thing i'm focusing on with this so um the more you know about a location the better you can describe it right um and i think it's also really helpful to um do perception roles this is something that i use very often um and it's a way for me in order to kind of set up the setting you know so i'll have a, a group of players i'll just before they even get to a, a certain environment, I'll have them all roll for preparation. And then in um, my my notes, I do like to have a lot of notes as GM, I will put down, let's say there's six players, I will put down six different things that, that I can describe or that the, the players can see. And then, you know, whoever rolls the best perception, they see whatever the most important thing is. And then the second sees something a little bit less important. And then so on as you kind of go down the list and the sixth person maybe just doesn't see anything or something they you know they're kind of not paying attention whatever um and then the, uh, using those notes in order to kind of flesh out my descriptions um and i think this also you know using um really colorful language and using um you know uh descriptions that are uh, you know, make you create an image in your head that takes practice. So that's not something you're going to get right away. Um, but you know, maybe again, write some notes down, write some, write in certain things, like maybe a sentence about, um, what this, what a certain area might look like. Um, because again, you, the, the players don't know what they're stepping into. They are stepping into your world. And of course they want to interact with things and they want to make their own decisions, but they can't do it that if they don't have anything to work with. So if you kind of just say, oh, you guys go into a ship and then you fly over to a planet, like you know that could be any type of ship the inside what does the inside look like you know you really have to dig in deep with with the, those types of things and this is just general for any gm it doesn't have to be just star wars um but i think because of the narrative aspect of this um descriptions also help to propel a story and um and, and it fills time because time can be tough to fill if you're just kind of going through the motions or maybe, you know, players are in a place and you don't have much information about this place. It, it may be really tough to kind of fill the time if you're not ready and you don't know where to take them. So um, another good thing that I want to point out, and this is something that um, I think evolved a little bit over time, and this is... Uh, you know, if you're having trouble engaging a group, and this can be especially true early on when, let's say, you have players who haven't played before, or, um, you know, maybe 
they're just not really sure what the campaign is like yet. So the first, you know, couple of sessions, you will have to do a lot of the, the work in order to engage some of the players, unless they're, you know, really good at role playing or they're really, you know, outgoing, they love talking. They, it might be a lot easier, but there are going to be some groups or, and some players who are not good at that. And so you have to individually engage them. And what I mean by that is, um, don't try to address the group. Um, and I did this a lot early on. I still do it. It's kind of hard not to, but, um, I think like a terrible question to ask players is you say, Oh, you guys go into this cantina as kind of an example. What are you all doing? You know, and, and putting that question out there, everyone just kind of sits there and goes, I, I don't know like what's happening, you know? So, um, don't do that. Don't, don't kind of put these broad questions out there and say, you guys see this person in the corner. What do you do? Um, instead have them, you know, we're going to stick with the cantina kind of as our, um, example throughout this, but you know, have the players walk into the cantina and then you start with character a and you say, character a, you walk over to the bar and you see some, you know, grizzle looking, you know, almost like a street thug. He's wearing dirty clothing and he's, you know, and, and talk about what they're specifically seeing and, and kind of com you know, compartmentalize their story. Um, and then you can kind of move on to the next character or, or do whatever the encounter might be with them, a quick conversation, and then move on to the next character. And um, this is also something that um, it's really helpful to understand your players' roles and their careers in this because then you can sort of personalize your narrative so that they are doing things that um, are important to your, their character or things that their character is interested in. For instance, if you have like a spy and infiltrator, you know, type of rogue player, um, you can have them, maybe they notice some valuables on, uh, you know, someone who's sitting at a sabac table. So maybe you, you're inviting that player to go and, and maybe pickpocket them or something. Um, and this kind of goes into the opportunities, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but <clears throat> really focusing on what a character their motivation is. I think knowing your character's motivations, their backgrounds, um, you know, kind of inviting them to uh, personalize the, the, their experience in the story is really helpful. Um, and one thing you don't want to do is exclude players. Or let's say there's a player who isn't great at role playing, is quiet, kind of, you know, sits back, doesn't say too much. Um, you don't want to ignore them throughout an entire session. You want to make sure you engage that player and, um, and kind of, you know, get them to enjoy themselves. And then on the contrary, if you have someone who takes over every situation, that's another good, um, good, uh, situation for you to maybe, you know, try to help them understand they need to pump the brakes a little bit and say, um, all right, well, you continue talking to this person and let's say they've been talking for 10 minutes. You continue to talk to this person, but you know, for now we're going to move on to this, you know, make sure you control that because it, it will happen every time. And this is, um, just going back to the, the question of what are you all doing? That question again is, is really bad because what it'll do is that if there's a player who is maybe the leader or is the one who's always talking, they're always going to be the one who talks first. And, um, that's not good. I, if you have one person just always kind of butting into the conversation and this happens, um, there are players who think it's their duty to, be be the the leader of the group and to basically run the entire story um this is not to kind of bash those types of players but um i think a lot of them just think to, to themselves that well hey you know no one else seems to be interacting um so i'm just going to do it and then they just keep doing that with every situation and so that's something you got to really try to break up a little bit um and this is why individual engagement is super important compared to just engaging the group as a whole. So that's something that has taken a little work for me to, to understand, but it, it does make a huge difference. I can say that. Um, number five, role opportunities. So to me, there are three types of roles that I look for when I'm GMing. The number, the, the first one is pretty simple, just combat roles. So that's just, you know, within combat. Don't really need to talk about that one too much. The other two are I think important. So one is forced roles from the GM. So this is something where maybe a player go, the, the player group goes into a certain situation and they need to roll for something. So again, you, they enter a new environment, they walk into a cantina, have them all roll for perception. I do that almost every time a group goes into a new environment, you know, they're walking into a jungle, roll for perception. You know, you are, um, 
walking into your, walking out of your ship onto a planet roll for perception all these situations um and again plan it out plan out what the players might see it really helps um because you're you're setting the scene you're giving each player a motivation you're giving each player a thing to do something to think about um so it really really helps um in order to to have <clears throat> separate things for players to look at when they enter a new environment because it, it gets the, the it gets the ball rolling right um other force roles that are going to come up um i think anytime the, the characters are in you know a frightening situation i think fear checks are super important to do discipline checks you know um if they're let's say a group is going up against darth vader they're gonna be doing some hard discipline checks let's say they've been walking in a jungle for you know for an entire night um that's going to be pretty frightening so you should have them roll for for fear checks and then you know use let's say they fail use that against them like have some negative consequences for a character who is afraid <clears throat> so the forced checks are um really helpful and as far as deciding the balance between you know should i have the players roll all the time should i focus more on narrative it will depend and it will also depend on your style as a gm i tend to lean towards um having the players roll more i think uh it's just fun that way and it's it shapes the narrative i think that's the, the reason the dice are there you might as well use them but there is a limit you don't want them to overroll um and i think a really good example of this i came across this in a couple sessions uh, a couple sessions ago um there was a player who was interrogating an enemy um you know it was like a black sun or something and they kept um trying to get information out of them and so you know at first i would have them roll for coercion because they're trying to force information out um and then they would do another coercion you know a sentence that was also um you know co coercion so i'll be like, oh he roll it again and I, it was too much so i think in those types of situations just let it play out you don't have to roll all the time um but make sure when the opportunity for a roll comes up that you capitalize on it or you try to hint to the players that they should capitalize on it um, and that's the third type of role that i want to go over and these are roles that are um decided by players so th things that they want to roll for that they tell you and they can either come up with something completely random or um, you can also create situations that might um persuade players to roll for something or might suggest that maybe they should roll for something here um so for instance um you know going into a jungle um and i'm just using this because in my campaign my group is currently in the jungle so um you know rolling uh, walking in the jungle they come across a dead animal if you have that type of encounter you're inviting a player to roll knowledge xenology um so i think making sure you put in opportunities for certain things to be rolled and keeping that diverse you don't want to have players just only rolling for perception all the time only doing combat roles only doing you know deception whatever um try to use different ones and it can be hard sometimes to use all of them but you know there might be a character who's really really strong in knowledge xenology so why put that to waste right you might as well have some opportunity for that player to use that um trait in order to you know get some really good information so those are the three roles and i think it's important to have a good mix of those um again you don't want to overdo roles and uh but depending on how your style is you may want to keep it open and have little to no roles you might just want to only be narrative based and that i think is totally fine um but my i think my issue with that is if a play, if a team is going on a mission specifically uh, like a mission not just kind of wandering around a town or talking to people or getting supplies um i think it's important in order to kind of uh decide you know their the, the level of success they have in a mission to do some roles so like you know you shouldn't have them just you know entering a, a blast door like there should be some difficulty and that's what the, the dice provide some difficulty um so that's um rolls kind of my input on that um the next thing that i want to discuss a little bit is uh, adding subplots and um 
there's a couple reasons I think subplots are important. Number one is that they are good time fillers. Um, if you're doing a session, and again, because this is so narrative heavy, it can be hard to fill time some, you know, at times. Maybe you, um, you know, you only prepared so much and now you're not really sure what to do, you know, have some kind of, kind of side plot uh, or subplot available. Um, for players to do and sometimes you might that might divert the entire session to just the subplot and i think that's okay it might open new doors so that's one thing to, to fill up time but it also is a good distraction um and subplots are a fantastic way to create red herrings and i think um rpg games it's super important to have dead ends and red herrings and kind of confusion of information you want to have interweaving storylines and interweaving information because uh you don't want the story to a be too linear um and or, or too boring so um for instance if you start you know your campaign session one and you know the players can already kind of map out where the story is going to go that's really bad you don't want that to happen so always be kind of shifting you know ch change up you know your strategies add subplots in order to have the players do something while really on the sidelines this other thing is, is happening um it, I, pr I promise it will make the game 1000 times more fun for not only you as the gm because you get to kind of you know mess around with the players but the players will also enjoy the suspense they'll enjoy the mystery of it um so yeah, and, and I think red herrings are great. You know, putting certain mysterious items on characters so they see them like, oh, what is this? And they try to figure out, and maybe they, they go really hard on, on trying to find out what this certain mysterious item is, but maybe it means nothing, you know? Um, and so it's just a good way to, to confuse the players. Um, and it may seem like a little, uh, you know, deceptive, but really it just creates a good session, in my opinion. So subplots, definitely have them... Um, you know, and uh, I think, you know, one, another good reason for a subplot is just to occupy maybe a character who isn't super involved in the main storyline at the moment. Maybe they don't really have much to do. Maybe they go talk to someone in the cantina and they give them um, a bounty to, to go find someone else, whatever that might be. Um, so that's uh, subplots. The next thing I want to go over is improvising. So um, just kind of as a, you know, precursor. I am definitely the type of GM who likes to prepare a lot. Um, I think over time my improvising has gotten better, but I like to be prepared. I like to know kind of what my NPCs are, what the situations I have are going to, you know, what I know is going to come up. And uh, this is why improvising take, took a lot of practice for me. It still takes a lot of practice, but you do kind of get an idea of, of how to deal with situations over time so let's say you know a session is completely derailed and a, a team or group goes completely off topic maybe they travel to a planet that you were not even expecting them to go to and so now you have to imp you have to improvise an entire planet you have to figure out what you're going to do for this planet um this is why having a bank of NPCs is so important. I went over this in, I think, the campaign creation guide a little bit. Um, having a bank of NPCs is super important because maybe you don't have anything prepared for that player, but you do have a bank of NPCs that you can use. Um, and you also, maybe you have some subplots written down or, you know, different things prepared that you can also use. Maybe you have certain locations on another planet that you've prepared, and now you can kind of shift those a little bit to be on this new planet. Um, so... If you are not a natural improviser, prepare. Just, just, just. You, you will have to now double your preparation time in in order to be ready for improvising. Um, and I think going back to the descriptions a little bit, a big part of GMing for me in Star Wars is visual visualization, right? So having an idea of what a scene will look like in my head before I go into it so I can actually view where the characters are standing what is going on what you know what um, what things might be going on at the bar in a cantina what might people be saying to each other at the Sabat game things like that so I can really get into the situation um, because again the players are looking to you 
in order to give them the vis- the visuals. The, you know, they are not able to visualize something that they don't have control over. It's not their story. It's your story. You have to kind of um, transpose your uh, you know visualization of a scene to them. So you have to make sure you do that either by description or by conversations with characters um, or by just having them interact with certain things. So, um, improvising takes practice. That's the number one thing. If, you know, if you're not good at it, just practice. Um, so that's kind of my input on that. Um, number eight, the storyline. And this is, um, going back to preparation a little bit and, you know, how the question here is how, you know, much should you stick to the story? How much should you plan in the story? Is it okay to kind of let your story fall apart? Um, you know, how should you manage that? This goes back to, it's your preference. If you want to keep a campaign completely open and go session to session, kind of creating, um, kind of creating your campaign as you go, really, you know, relying on the planners, the, the, the players to provide you with, um, input on, on what to do next, then I think that's totally fine. You don't have to do much preparation. For me, that doesn't really work. And I, as a GM, I want to be telling a good story. I want to surprise players. I want to have um, really fun twists and turns. I want to have cool battles. I want to have a nice ending. I want to have rising action, you know, and I want to have, you know, some really negative things happen in the story. It's it, I, I want there to be a good arc um, for the players to experience because that it, it's satisfying to, to go through that. Um, so I think for me... I will stick to a story a little bit more closely than maybe some other people. Um, that's because I uh, I enjoy writing. So being able to write down what I want to happen and then allowing the players to experience that just helps me a lot. Um, it may it may make some of my sessions suffer a little bit because maybe I'm not improvising as much or maybe I'm forcing the players you know to kind of follow my story when maybe they want, might want to do something else. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, I, I do stay open to players doing anything else. If, if, if a team or a group tells me that, you know, let's say they just killed, um, you know, a black son that they were interrogating and they say, you know what, we need to escape here. We're just going to go somewhere else. We're going to go to another planet. I'll let them do it. I'm not going to, you know, tell a group they can't do something, but, um, I do want to make sure that they hit the story points because, that's how I know it's going to be a good story. So that's um, that's kind of how I deal with that. Number nine is combat management. And um, this actually goes a little bit more with 12. Um, so managing combat can be really difficult because you have a lot of things that you're juggling at once. Um, so the number one thing with combat is, again, know what you're enemies can do your npcs know what their stats are um know what their weapons are and in general just know weapons know their stats you know you want to know all of their qualities understand what qualities are um so if players try to activate something you can actually explain it because um most players will not know all of the weapon qualities you know and they won't um you know they might have trouble with understanding how to activate crit you know, and they might, so, so there are certain things you need to make sure you understand with combat. Um, the good thing about combat in Star Wars is it is very open. You don't have to stick to like a grid as you might in, let's say D and D or something like that. Um, it is just the range. So, you know, as long as a, a character is in range and this is something that you describe narratively, then it's totally fine for them to, to kind of run wherever they might like, you know, um, it's a lot more open. Um, to be honest, I like the structure of the D&D combat. I really like, you know, you can only move so so much, certain amount of, of feet. Uh, I, th- I just think it, it gives a lot more structure to combat and it like, makes it a little bit more cohesive. Um, Star Wars, Star Wars combat is kind of like, oh, you know, whatever I, you know, you do what it, you kind of do whatever you want. Um, as long as you're sticking to the one maneuver and the one action. Um, so, and, and the reason, another reason why I, you know, kind of have some trouble with the combat is because, because it's so loose and so open, players will try to take advantage of things. Not all the time, but some players might try to overdo things in combat. They might try to, I mean, maybe they get one advantage and they say, um, well, I'm going to use my advantage to say that this wall falls down and kills this guy. Like, you can't do stuff like that in combat. You know, an advantage is not supposed to be like an end-all kind of thing. 
Um, so managing that uh, with players, making sure they they're using combat, um, uh, combat uh, you know correctly, in a way that isn't too strong, um, I think is is good. So, uh, and another thing with combat is don't baby them. Don't baby them in combat because and I still you know I, I'm halfway more than halfway through this campaign right now that I'm doing with my players, and they stomp over almost every single um, battle that they come across, and I'm I'm giving them really difficult <laughs> enemies to fight, they're just, you know, it's just, there's so many of them, they have good weapons, they mod them, you know, they have stats, they have, you know, they've gotten a lot of XP, so they use the XP to get really strong stats, so, you know, make sure you're, you're throwing difficult things at them. Um, maybe even make sure, you know, every now and then a character might go unconscious, they might go full wound threshold. Um, and strain is also something that I would recommend you use a lot, and I still forget to use strain sometimes, but it's a really good kind of um, side tool to use for disadvantages, um, or even advantages, gaining strain, losing strain, um, using strain in order to get a, you know an extra maneuver, using strain you know to do certain things. Um, so I think that's you know that's another really good thing to, to keep in mind. Use strain um, as well. So that's kind of my input on on the combat system. Again, I don't think it's a perfect system, but it works within this game. Um, number ten, finding voices. Uh, I, for one, am not a very good voice actor. I don't do voices very well. It's not my thing. But I do think that you should try to vary your voice a little bit as a GM, because if you talk to players in the exact same voice, it's going to pull them out of the experience. They're going to feel disconnected. They're just going to feel like they're talking to you and not a character. So maybe it's you know lightening a little bit. Maybe it's making it a little deeper. Um, you know, adding a little bit of scruff to a voice can usually be very very effective, especially if you have maybe a kind of a, a more evil character. You know, having like a scruffy, deep deep voice might really help set the mood. So adjust your voice a little bit. Um, if you're good at voice acting, that's great. You know, go with that. But um, I do think it's important when you're creating your NPCs to kind of pick a voice for them, even practice it a little bit, see how it sounds, record yourself, see how a voice sounds, and then once you have something that you think sounds good, use it because it will definitely um, engage the players a lot more. Um, so that's that's kind of a, a simple one. Um, but then the next one, uh, so 11 and 12 are kind of unique. You know, I, um, I decided to put these because uh, I just noticed with number 11, the importance of uh, being quiet sometimes as a GM and letting players just interact with each other and interact with, you know, um, their environment, whatever they might want to do, kind of letting them take the wheel in a lot of situations. Because it can be um, easy as a GM, especially if, let's say, you want to have the story go a certain way or you're trying to like really have your input and, you know, control on the way a session is going, it may be really easy to kind of. Um, do it a little too much, kind of butt in, you know, let's say a, a group of, of players are sitting at a table and they're talking with each other, and every time they say something, you butt in and try to add a description, you know, it can kind of break the, um, the, the flow of the conversation and the way the players are interacting with each other, um, so... I think sometimes as GM, if it's appropriate, if they're talking to each other, to just sit back, let them talk, and then once there's a lull, because a, a lull will eventually come, then you can kind of, um, you know, come back in, say something like, all right, well, while you guys are talking, this, something else happens, you know, and, and kind of really, you know, do a nice segue into whatever the, the next thing might be that they, they do. So, knowing when to be quiet, as a GM is very important, um, so that the players can kind of, you know, enjoy the, the role playing. Um, in the last one, say no. I think this is, um, very important, uh, because there will be situations when, again, this kind of goes back to the thing about combat. There will be players who they don't do it on purpose, but they might try to either break your um, session, break your campaign. They might try to run it off the rails. They might try to do something that's you know, way too, um, it's too much, you know, you, it, it goes a little too far. So don't be afraid to say no, because if you don't, then 
the players have complete control and it's it's like you know like combat almost doesn't matter you know if a player just decides to do things and they will you know they'll come up with these crazy ideas and you'll be like you'll just sit there and be like i was not expecting this at all and it's crazy and you know it's it's game breaking you know for instance i had a player who's like i want to attach an atst to the top of our ship and <laughs> and i was like well okay but how would you go about doing that you can't just say to me that you want to attach an atsc to the top of a ship so you can just destroy people on your ship like you know just have some have a conversation with players and i think compromise is a big part of this so um you know i think if you just flat out say no then that might really kind of bum people out a little bit especially if they were really interested in something but kind of compromising with them or if something is outrageous and ridiculous and you think that it's game breaking make it hard like make it really difficult so like for instance going back to the atsc on the ship if a player wants to attach an atsc for a ship then it's going to be an insanely difficult mechanics check in order to attach that thing or maybe it's going to be several really hard mechanics check checks um in order to do that so that's a good way as for me as a gm to let a player kind of know how i feel about something or letting them know that like yeah this is crazy it's going to be hard because of how crazy it is um or how game breaking it is and uh you know players will get it they'll they'll understand that um you know but but it's it's good for them to have the crazy ideas and to be creative and um you know so but i do think it's not a bad idea to kind of you know put your foot down in certain situations um but you know also allow allow for the 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 crazy things to happen sometimes um because it'll just add flavor to a session um so yeah i think that's pretty much everything that i wanted to go over um again this is just kind of an overview of, of how i approach gming um there are so many different pieces of, of advice or you know advice that i probably don't even have or don't even know about that could be given to, for players who want to gm in, in the star wars system but i think uh this is a kind of a good overview and i hope you got some information out of it if there was anything that you were wondering about or that you want to ask about please put in the comments i'd love to to kind of uh see those those comments and and try to answer them if i can um and I also invite any other GMs who might be watching this to put in their input um, as well in the comments. Just so we can get a comprehensive overview of GMing. Because uh, the, the, the greatest thing about this game, again, is that it's narrative focused. And it's Star Wars. So it's something that, you know, players who are, are playing it, they probably know a good amount about Star Wars. And so involving yourself in this type of universe... Um, you know, there's so many things that you can do with Star Wars. It really is just so much fun. So, um, if you haven't GM'd yet, if you're playing as a player and you think that GMing might be too much, maybe just create a one shot, you know, take, take a week to create a really, really fun one shot and try it out and, and to kind of see what happens. And if, and Hey, if the first session is bad, don't worry about it. My first session was terrible. So, it, you know, it's, it's going to be fine. Anyways, thank you all so much for watching, um, and uh, I hope to be coming out with more videos soon since, you know, everything that's been going on right now, kind of locked up, um, you know, I'm working and stuff, but really have a lot of time on my hands, so I might be making some more videos soon. If you do have any suggestions for things you want to see, just let me know. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you soon.